Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Science of SAS Startups podcast. Today, I'm talking to Niels Martin Brockner. Uh, Niels is the, the CEO and founder of Contract Book. They help customers to automate every step of the, the contract lifecycle. Niels, welcome. Thank you. So I just want to start off by asking you a few quick questions just to help the audience uh, get to know you a little bit. So first one is, what, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Caramel. Caramel, okay, nice. And if you- Salted, ca it, salted caramel, salted caramel. Okay, so really, you can't have caramel without salt these days. They, they've kind of taken over the caramel market for salt. Exactly, salted caramel. Yeah. Um, and if you could visit any different era, um, it doesn't have to be in human history, it could be pre-human, uh, which, which era would you choose to visit? I think I would like to kind of see the, the I don't even know what area that is, but like dinosaurs. Like I saw, I saw a movie on the science of how big the, the even the ants were kind of when dinosaurs was around. I would love to see that that in, in real like like the kind of how big everything was at that point, like kind of wildlife. Yeah. But from a good distance, yeah. Yeah, good distance. <laughs> like like very good distance. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, not, I'm not too fond of ants and the creep and that kind of stuff. So, but I would love to see it. I think it's just terrifying. It's a bit like the the whale or not the, the shark. I have my biggest fear in life is meeting a megalodon, you know, the white shark, which is a shark that's on that has the size of a, a, the white whale or something like that, which is a, a very, very big shark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what I was the last from thing? the dinosaurs as well? Sorry, that's from the dinosaurs. Okay. As well. So next question is, what was the last thing that you did just for yourself? Uh, um, watched an NBA game. Okay. That, is that I, what you I, like to do? I to, enjoy to watching sports. Play? I enjoy watch, 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 watching sports a lot. It really, like, it's, it's something that really excites me. And I watched, uh, I watched an NBA game re recently, and that was really nice. Okay, so this might answer the next question as well. So if you could download one skill, like in the, the Matrix movies, what would it be? One skill from the Matrix movie? Well, it doesn't have to be in the Matrix movie, but if you could download any skill and just become an instant expert at it, what would you, what would you be? I thought it would have, have to be kind of from the Matrix movie. No, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, Kung Fu. Uh, okay. Um... <clears throat> I want to say photographic memory, but but uh, but uh, but yeah, I think something like that. Okay. So now, if we jump into to contract book, um, so do you want to to kick things off by giving us an overview of the company and, and what you're trying to do? Sorry, one more time. Can you repeat? So do you want to just kick things off by giving us an overview of contract book and and what you what you're trying to do? Yeah, so uh, Contract Book is an end-to-end -end contract management platform. Basically, it's CLM 2.0. Uh, we call it data-driven document automation. Uh, we that's a lot what I kind of a, a thing we we're coining inside our own little business here. Uh, we think that CLM is basically built for enterprises, and we don't want to be associated with enterprises because our focus area is working with SMBs. Uh, so we have a very narrow target group where we try basically try to help out SMBs with managing documents in a way that they never managed documents in a way before. And it's a it's 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 basically unlocked the past 10 years. It should have been unlocked the past 10 years due to the te te technology level we're working in. So so I feel that we've been working on 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 on, on building a core platform for contract automation uh, for the past kind of uh four years, I want to say five years. And, and now we're in a very good place to basically not just sign documents, but automate the full process and, and actually kind of give documents the afterlife that it, they deserve. Um, so, so that's kind of our core mission is to kind of help SMBs not hire a million people in admin, but just, you know, automate themselves out of admin. Yeah, like when I was kind of doing some research into you guys, I really love the um, the contract generator solution because I think like every small business has been in that situation where they're kind of trawling the internet for a contract or some wording that, that might be fit for, fit for purpose. And this looks like an amazing kind of short, 
shortcut to that. But it, how it, do you, sorry. It is, it is, it's a bit like Contract Express. Like there is an old software called Contract Express that via logic generates a lot of documents. The problem is that it generates basically a PDF and, and you know, that's dead. Uh, so even though the tech is actually smart, the tech makes ultimately makes the, 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 the data dead where we are kind of, you're doing the same stuff. You're just client facing it so that so you don't have to be a legal professional to do it. And then you kind of allow your clients or your future employees to actually do it themselves or even your normal standard employees who's not legal professionals to actually work in a drafter that actually allows you to, you know, not make mistake in the creation process, first of all. And second of all, actually give the documents in afterlife based on the data in the documents. Yeah, okay. And in how do you see yourself scaling the, the business? Is this primarily a direct sale or do you see it more growing through marketing or partner networks? Inbound partnerships would be would be preferable and is what it is how it works right now. So 70%, more than 70% of our sales is inbound at this point. Yeah, okay. And obviously, this is a market with a, like a very big name, you know, which has kind of started to kind of digitize the, the contract process. Like, what, what do you see that the DocuSign are missing right now that you, the contract book are, are able to serve better? A proper data layer. So is that something they don't offer at all? No, they offer they offer like some complex tools on top of whatever software they have. But ultimately, um, traditional signatures is PDFs that then get re-signed as PDFs and then recreates a PDF. And every time you get like you, you you kill the data. So like and then you basically have to use OCR scanning or some kind of ML on top of it just to figure out what the fuck the data is. Like you need to figure out what it is that you're working with. So every time you PDF something, you're basically killing the data. It's like printing it. I get in, you might as well print it. So what we're doing is we're never print, like we're never PDFing it unless you're actually extracting it and want the sealed envelope where the default of every other signature tool is actually to envelope it and kill the data. Where our default is to keep the data alive. And then if you need it for, let's say some kind of lawsuit or like to use as evidence or send it to some kind of formal agency or something like that, then you could, then you can use it. But the idea is that you actually keep it alive and then only extract it and kill it when you need to. But when you even kill it, there is still the living data still is still there. I guess it's a bit difficult to explain, but it basically these guys are working for enterprises and they're doing it in the same way we do and do done it for 30 years, which is completely fine and they're going to keep doing it. But the generation, the Gen Z and millennials, they expect, you know, the world to work like Google and Facebook yeah. and Instagram. And PDFs will never allow that. Like that, they, they cannot help you with anything. They cannot assist you. Like, so my mom thinks Google is, you know, your, it, my enemy because it helps me, you know, suggest stuff that I, based on my, my ICP or whoever I am, it suggests stuff that expects me. So if I write Denmark something, it would probably suggest that I should, uh, you know, do I want games like in the Euros. I do want tickets for the Euros because it knows what I'm reading, like what it, what it does without kind of, and I don't feel that that's, and, and in the same way, Contrabook can suggest stuff based on your other agreements that what you need to do. The cool part is that we don't read anything because we have the data layer. So if you, if you put ML on top of it, like if you do OCR on top of it, you have to understand the actual machine learning. You have to understand what's in the documents. Whereas what we do is that we, we just have a binary code that says that this is a date, which means 01110 in the code or something. And based on that, we can we can say based on the fact that you have that late, late data label, we don't understand the rest of the contract. We just understand the fields that that you're looking for, and then we can create automated tasks or recreate documents or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is impossible with a PDF. Yeah. Okay. So I think you mentioned it too. So so fundamentally, yeah. Sorry. 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 No. No. Carry on. No, no. So, so fundamentally, the data layer is 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 what they're missing. Like they have bought Seal and some other kind of intelligent software to put on top. But it's, I think for SMBs, it's basically just too complicated. It needs to be simple for a for me. Like we're a hundred man organization. Like we have one part time junior legal person, like like who manages our docs. 
that's it because we use contract book. Like we have a, you know, we don't need a full, like a, a staff of people managing documents because it's not necessary because everything is automated. Like, I think you mentioned earlier, like how automation for a long time has been the preserve of the enterprise almost. And, and I think increasingly now, like over the last few years, we've seen more and more tech tools kind of added to the armory of, of smaller companies who are looking to, to kind of work much more efficiently. And, and obviously that there is a time when all of those companies kind of sit back and consider the ROI of all the different kind of tech tools that they're working with. Like how, how do you make sure that you kind of stick out in that conversation as a, you know, a sticky product to, to keep in the company? Uh, our sales size is often less than, is most often less than 30 days uh, compared to any enterprise software is 12, 18 months. Uh, our uh, onboarding time is, you know, a week. Uh, you can be up and running. If you bought it today, you could be up and running tomorrow, like fully up and running. And I think that speaks for itself. Like the, 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 the biggest difference is that we're built in one platform, one data layer. You don't need to build a, APIs and all kinds of stuff between it for it to add, like have a high ROI. Like it, it's built with a high ROI. Yeah, okay. And um, th there's a whole bunch of really exciting software companies coming out of Denmark at the moment. And the Nordics in general have got like a, you know, an amazing tradition of, of kind of technological innovation. Do, do you put that down to anything specific? People are fairly highly educated here. And I think that there is a lot of journalists and journalists tend to kind of look at, you know, at the, at the whole thing and say, okay, is there anything I can, I can, I can make better? Uh, that might be a purpose. Uh, there is also very high uh, social security here. So taking a chance on doing something kind of most likely will not end your life. Whereas if you kind of, if there is not the same kind of uh, like security ropes around every other country, right? So yeah, Nordics yeah, have really high security ropes in terms of kind of, if you fail, uh, then, then there is something that will pick you up. Uh, so there might be more people testing it out if, if they can you know, become a, a self-employed person. Um, but I, I don't know what fundamentally. I, I, I think I read somewhere that everybody believes that the Swedes have more uh, uh, unicorns than Denmark, but Denmark actually, like Sweden has like five and we have eight or nine, but people don't really know about ours. Uh, okay. which is it's interesting because I actually thought until I checked it, I thought that the Swedes were better than the Danes at this. Uh, so, so, but I think that ultimately the, the Nordic countries maybe just allow a lot of freedom in terms of security and therefore people also dare to take the big chance. Yeah, no, it, it's definitely interesting because, you know, you really punch above your weight in, in terms of kind of Europe or even other areas of the world in, in terms of kind of number of startups like per capita and, and that, that kind of thing. So no, it's interesting to understand the background to that. And in terms of the, the contract automation market, you know, looking to the future, like what, what do you see as being the trends in this market? You know, where, where do you kind of see technology evolving? I, I think the technology evolves around having the correct, correct as what we're doing. I think our fundament is very good in terms of kind of the data layers on and then based on kind of the return of the investment is over the is via automations and automations doesn't necessarily mean that you have to fire people. It just means that you free up people's time to do something more valuable for your business. And, and um, yeah, so, so, I I I I I I think that the automations is the key right now, and for to do automations as easy as possible, you need a a very intelligent data layer that makes sense, or not intelligent, but a machine friendly data layer that you can work in. Okay, so if we move on now to talking about the startup life, so Contract Book have had uh, two or two rounds of investment, um, have had around forty three million dollars altogether, and you had a, a Series B of around thirty million dollars uh, last month. So how did you find the um, the fundraising process like this time round? Because the you know the investment market is really crazy at the moment. There's a, a huge amount of investment going into so many different software companies. What was yours uh, like a really easy case to make to the VCs, or were there like specific challenges that, that you needed to face? Uh, 
I, I think it was, um, I, 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 not, nothing's never easy, but I think that the, the, it's fairly straightforward. Um, I think that people buy into what we're doing. I think that most of our investors, they've actually invested in DocuSign, so they know what DocuSign offered the market 10, 15 years ago. And they also understand because of the trends and the other investments they have, what contract book might offer to the next generation of contract management people, right? Like, um, so, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's mainly, uh, I think it's very easy for them to understand what they're doing because if you look at Bessemer, they run their cloud hundred. If they look at, okay, what are the primary trends in within SaaS businesses? They would say, okay, so you have, all of these kind of automation plays and tech savvy tech solutions. And now you can see, okay, there's somebody wickling themselves into that virality game that signatures are basically. Like there's a lot of kind of, when you send a contract, then you get a new user, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they saw that whole exercise before. And when Google invested via Gradient, um, they, they primarily invested in the data format. They said that, you know, Google Docs cannot offer the same kind of you know, data layer that you guys can do. So we believe that the foundation of the future is going to be something like that within this space. Like it's not going to be, you know, a Google Docs. It can't be, it cannot be PDF. It cannot because of the data layer that they work in. That doesn't mean that Google Docs is not a great product. It just means that for building automations and AI, it's not optimal. Uh, so, so I think Think that the syndicate of investors also so when you first have gradient that basically unlocks Bessemer. when you have Bessemer, that unlocks uh the tigers of the world and it shows that you're best in class basically and they don't hire and they don't you know they don't invest in companies that they don't feel would be able to become very very big or have the fund foundations to build something great yeah okay um, and we spend a lot of time in, in startup land thinking about what makes a company attractive to investors but what, what about the other way around? Like what makes an investor attractive to a software company other than all the money that they offer? <laughs> uh, I think that, that, that like we have a great syndicate of investors, I would say. So, so the Danish fund we have called by founders is very good. They invested with Gradient. They've been, they're very good at doing early stage investments and really understand the path that a young company goes through and really helpful in terms of setting goals and helping you to focus and you know do all the right moves at the right time. Um, Besamir is a more, I don't want to say professional, but they have you know, 100, 100 years of experience going back to whenever, like the first, I think it was like Gibbs and the first American uh, unicorn ever. That's kind of where their story started. So they have all the data of all the companies in all the worlds and they're participated in, I think it, they did, I think they were main found, like investors in 25% of the 100 biggest uh, software IPOs ever. So they really know their shit, basically. They just know they can, they, they're really good at what they call pattern matching and seeing, okay, these tendencies we see in this company, which is the same tendencies that we saw in this company five years ago and two months ago and, and, and 10 years ago. And therefore we think this is the right move to invest in these guys. So it's not only the unit economics, but it's also something about pattern matching between the setups and the founders and how they like, how, how it might not be that you're not necessarily the best within that right now, but you have the over, over, over good over here, like super good over here, meaning like if we see that kind of index that you're index 170 here and index 80 here, then index, index 80 here isn't a problem because you're so high over here or something like yeah. that. They can kind of recognize that fact, whereas it had, if it had been opposite where it would be 80, 170, they might've said, we don't want to believe in because these 80 are not scalable. Where they believe in those 170, 170 is 100% scalable. I'm just you know saying random yeah, numbers, yeah. But, but the idea is that they are really good at pattern matching and understanding and they have a great history, which means it allows other investors to stop believing in it. So when you can, if you can convince, convince the tier one investors to invest in your company, that basically is a you know benchmark or a proof of concept towards the other good investors. And and then you know one thing takes it out. We had multiple term sheets in both rounds, in both A and B, and um, felt comfortable what about what, what we we're doing. So um, it was pretty straightforward to be fair. Yeah. Okay. And what, what do you feel is the biggest mistake that you've made since you uh, founded Contract Book? And, and would you change that if you could go back or, or was that part of the journey that, that brought you here today? 
Um, the biggest mistake is is focus. It's always focus. I think a a a better you become at focusing and understanding what problem is you're solving and for who, uh, the faster you're going to grow. Um, I think that investors can really help you that way. They can help you gain the focus if they can, for me, they need to explain me how to reverse engineer it and, and make me understand how to, how to focus. Not just tell me what, like that I need to focus. They need to say, the experience is that if you focus on these, these, and these things, or these three things, top level, then you have, then you'll become a tier one company. Um, I think investors can be good at actually focusing on the stuff that they need to focus on. Like if investors are yeah. great at telling you and be focusing on the right stuff and saying, this is what I want to measure on. I don't care about anything else. I care about these three things because we know that if you excel in these three things, you're going to be a tier one company in a, a B, C, D, whatever round. Um, so it starts basically with management, right? As you say, in a company, like, 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 doing it well but when you have investors your investors and your board pushes you to do stuff so they need to be good at at helping you with focusing so i was i would say focus personally yeah okay and is is contract book the first b2b company that you founded because I, I saw that you did some b2c companies previously yeah. it is yeah so what what do you see as being the biggest differences in approach to how you build in those different types of markets we like our sales size is pretty short, right? So it's still kind of, we, we target the SMBs where some would, would argue that it could be between contract book and Netflix, right? Like then a personal economy uh, kind of thinking for a small company or micro company. So, so I think there is a lot of emotions that also go into buying this product. I think we're growing into a mid-sized target group now, whereas it's less of that, where when we started, it had a lot of the same tendencies as, as a B2C. Um, but there is, there is, we are not an enterprise product, so therefore, it's, it's. There is some similar tendencies uh, where we could draw the the, the emotion uh, of selling and and the brand of creation and stuff like that, where it became you know less enterprise ish, and therefore we could I could draw on some of the experiences. I would say. Yeah. Okay. And when you start a company and everybody's wearing seventeen different hats and you're doing a million different things. And you start to grow and you build different individual areas of specialization and different business units. Like, how do you keep everybody aligned towards the same goal as you make that transition from generalist to, to kind of specialization? Great question. I, again, I think it's, it comes down to focus and transparency. So if you're really good at setting top line goals and being transparent about your goals and where you need to be and why and explaining why you need to be at that point your employees will understand it better and they will have an easier time also if i have to reverse engineer my company into being top tier in the next funding round i also can help my employees reverse engineer them and them to be top tier in in, in their space for the next round so if i'm pretty kind of transparent 100 percent transparent about what we do and why we do it and how we're going to get there it can help people go from generalists to specialists or explaining them why they now need to focus in an area of top like topic area that they might prior not have you know thought about working in like that because they understand that it's for the greater good of the company and and but i think that's you know transparency and goal setting that's important here which basically comes down to focus again and, and is there any kind of challenge in the last year around doing that like around um you know everybody working more remotely like keeping everything kind of transparent and moving in the right direction well um, no we were we, we were born remote so okay. we've been working remote since day one um before it was cool what sorry before it was cool before it was cool so <laughs> yada and i my co-founder one of my two co-founders um we've been you know building companies basically since 12 together and we always had remote first like or at least a hyper structure and today you would see that we have an office in copenhagen it's primarily commercial people but everybody can work out of the office we also have an office in new york again everybody can work out of and they can they can not uh so 70 every day 70 percent and 75 percent of the companies work in remote so so it's more like so, so it's, it is, we're born that way. We're, and that is why the, trans, the transparency and the goal setting is key for this to work. 
Yeah. OK, well, I really appreciate your time today, Niels. I'm, I'm very aware of your time um, and it was great to hear more about Contract Book and I urge everybody to, to go and check it out and, um, you know, find out more about what you guys are doing. Cool. Thanks. OK, speak to you soon. Thanks, Niels. Bye. Thank you. Bye.